Hello and welcome back. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports in Westfield, Indiana, and you are watching Marksman TV. Today I have another weekly used gun review episode. Remember, in these videos, we take about eight used firearms that have come into the store and give you guys about a two to four minute review on each to give you guys an idea of some stuff that is out there on the market. Remember, the point of this video is not to sell you anything. We are just making this video for informational and educational purposes only. Anyway, with all of that out of the way, let's go ahead and jump into it now. Okay, remember the format of this video is we start with most common and move through least common as the video progresses. Starting off, I have a Magnum Research Desert Eagle, which is what this one is named. Now that is not to be confused with the full-size Desert Eagle we all know from movies like The Matrix and video games, the 50 Action Express or 44 Magnum variant. Now many of you have probably seen these at your gun stores or at gun shows, and they have been imported and manufactured under many different names, the original being the 941 Jericho. They've been imported as simply the Jericho. They've been imported by Magnum Research as the Baby Eagle, as the Desert Eagle, as this one is marked. Mossberg and Sons imported them for a while under the name the Uzi Eagle. They are all the exact same firearms. So basically this would come into existence in 1990 and was first imported into the United States by KBI. Again, Mossberg and Sons and Magnum Research would import them under a variety of different names for U.S. importation purposes. Now, the Jericho 941 or the 941 Jericho was a IMI, Israeli Military Industries, later named IWI, Israeli Weapons Industries, is what they are known as today. And it was a popular pistol along, among the American consumer market as well as used with the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces. It was always known as being a very durable, very rugged firearm, which was great in sandy or rugged conditions, and was a great military and police service style firearm. It would be manufactured in 9mm, 40, 45, and 41 Action Express. Now, the 41 AE had been developed by IWI in the late 80s, and actually when this would hit the market in the 1990s, it was quickly adapted for the round. As I understand it, it has similar ballistics to something like a 10 millimeter, but never caught on, especially in the US civilian market, and was quickly scrapped from production of this firearm as well as others. Um, this one here has a polymer design, so in 2015 IWI did have a U.S. based operation which were importing their own firearms uh, and they would announce the creation of a polymer frame version, typically they were a steel frame. Uh, both in a compact and a full size and of course 9, 40, and 45. Now this one here is a 40 in the polymer frame. But this is an early import, or earlier import by uh, Magnum Research, again mar marketed as the Desert Eagle. Now it is a double action, single action firearm with a decocker. And would actually take a lot of the functional uh, design features of that of the CZ-75. So it does have a slide that fits inside the frame, giving it a very low bore axis, a very low slide profile, very narrow controls, and you actually use the decocker arms here as gripping points to charge the firearm. Um, just known as a very, very nice firearm service style firearms. Um, the metal versions do sell for a little bit more. So on the new market, typically you're at $500 ish for the polymer frame, uh, up to about the six to $700 mark for the steel frame, you know, prior to all of this going on. Uh, right now the 40s used in the polymer frame, I'm seeing between about the four to 450 mark. Uh, this, you know, it has a couple mags, a little bit of wear on it, no box. Uh, the nine millimeters, of course, gonna go a little bit higher. There's only just always been more purchasers in the nine and 45 realm than there have been in the 40, but anyway, Really, really cool pistols, double sack magazine, nice trigger pull, very nice slide. I'll show you guys that. Reset. A pretty long release, but just a basic, you know, double single action trigger. And really long double action pull. But anyway, really, really cool firearms. Uh, happy to get this one in. I do not see too many used Jerichos, 941s, Baby Eagles, whatever you want to call them. Uh, most people who purchase them hold on to them. You can also find the surplus Israeli guns, the 941s, on the surplus market. And I've seen those around for about the three to four hundred dollar mark with the steel frame. Typically, a lot of holster wear. Those got imported maybe about a couple years ago. A batch of them came in, so you might see a couple of those floating around gun shows or on Gun Broker or whatever. But anyway, really cool pistols. Happy to get this one in. Okay, up next I have a SIG P238. Now, these were introduced at the 2008 
SHOT Show and are still in production today by SIG. And then a couple years later in 2011, they would introduce the 938, which was a nine millimeter version of this. This one, of course, is a 380. Now the philosophy on this was to get a small subcompact carry variation based on the 1911 model and was also based off of the concept of the Colt Mustang. In fact, I even believe that they use the same magazines um, whether it's the nine millimeter version or, or whichever from the 938 to the Mustang or the 238. Uh, this was like a 1911, a straight pull trigger with a single action trigger actuation or trigger pull. Uh, while the uh, hammer is in the back position, you can flip it onto safe just like you can on a 1911. Now these would all be issued or manufactured with night size and they had a variety of different configurations you could get it in. This one here is called the Blackwood with the two tone and the Blackwood grips. Uh, SIG marketing fashion, they take one of their product designs and basically uh, go crazy with different configurations, different color schemes, different grip options, trigger options, safety options, sight options, and they come out with like 15 different SKUs for each one of their products. Uh, the 238 and the 938 are some of those. So you can get like the Scorpion variations. Uh, they had one that was like in a rainbow configuration even, the all black, uh, the bitone, which you see here, the rosewood, the black wood grips. So just a bunch of different options on them. Now, typically on the new market, you're looking at about the five to $600 price point on these. Uh, used are typically in about the four to five. So uh, they do definitely maintain a lot of their value being a SIG product. Now, even though these are a little bit antiquated, uh, being about a 10 year old product, they still definitely have relevancy today. Now they do have a six round capacity on either the 938 or the 238. Uh, if we're looking at some of the polymer wonders that are out today, like the bodyguards, the LCP, you're actually going to be about the same size or lighter at the same capacity, but same people do like the alloy frame. This is, you know, full metal alloy frame, stainless steel slide, a little bit more of that heft and that weight, which is going to give you a little bit more recoil control, especially on a pocket gun like this. Now, my wife has carried around a 938 for a while, and sometimes I carry it as well. They are, for their size, pretty good on the recoil management, and they are also very accurate for what they are. So I've always been a fan of these. The 938, if you want the nine millimeter, again, is the same capacity, just a little bit bigger and a little bit heavier, but not really too much of a noticeable difference. I do get my fair share of used 238s and 938s I have over the years. Um, and again, like I mentioned, they do maintain their value, but for the most part, I do find that most people who do pick them up tend to hold on to them. If you like this concept, there are other things like it on the market. As mentioned, the Colt Mustang, and also more popularly right now, the Springfield 911 pistols, which, uh, share so similarly to these pistols that they actually even share the same magazines and they uh, Springfield sells them for half the price at about $25 whereas SIG is about $45 to $50 on these mags. Now brand new these would come with between one and three magazines depending on the package you got. A being that this has the old plastic blue box this is an earlier uh, variation of the pistol, but they really never uh, changed much during uh, their manufacturing. They have more or less remained the same since their release uh, back about 11 years ago. So anyway, really, really cool pistols. Happy to get them in. There's always buyers on this type of stuff, especially right now where the market on concealed carries is a little bit crazy. 380 ammunition, as we all know, is very tough to get right now, even harder than nine millimeter. But if you do have a supply of it uh, and you're looking for a concealed carry firearm, something like this, the 238 is a really cool, elegant design, really nice pistols. All right, up next, I have a pretty unique little revolver. This is an H&R Trapper model, H&R uh, standing for Harrington and Richardson. Now, Harrington and Richardson has always been known for making very inexpensive, affordable working man's firearms, anything from single shot shotguns and rifles to little 22 revolvers like this. And they always had a very inexpensive entry price. Now, the company has been around for a very long time. Uh, the story really beginning back as early as about 1859 with Frank Wesson, who is the brother of Daniel Wesson of Smith & Wesson. Uh, he would go into business, uh, really it was on a patents agreement or patent rights agreement um, with a gentleman of the name of Nathan Harrington. And these patents would be a, a revolving around simple uh, rifle and pistol designs. Now, Frank Smith, whose nephew was uh, Gilbert Harrington, went into business together in 1871. And that is typically the formation, uh, that was the formation of Smith and Harrington, which is usually accredited as the start date of the company of Harrington and Richardson. Now, about three years later in 1874, Richardson would buy Smith out of the company 
And a few years later, in about 18, uh, it was actually about 1879, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Harrington would actually go into business with a gentleman of the name of Augustus Richardson, uh, who he had actually met through dealing with Frank Smith and the Smith and Wesson Corporation. In 1888, the company would be founded as Harrington and Richardson, and that's as we know it today. Again, they would be very, very popularly known for making very affordable firearms like this. Uh, you know, remember in about the 1870s, things like the Colt Single Action Army and the Schofield Revolvers from Smith & Wesson are taking up a lot of prominence, but they were very expensive to be able to afford at the time for most people. So Harrington and Richardson forming in the 1870s, 1880s, again, came out to meet the market demands of things that were affordable, that any particular person, a farmhand, whoever you were, you could get into a reliable firearm. Now, the firearms have been produced for over 100 years. Uh, Marlin would end up getting the rights to the H&R uh, brand, and then, of course, Remington would purchase Marlin and all of its assets, so uh, Remington became the owner of the brand. Uh, tip I think the last actually branded H&R firearm manufactured was back in about 2015, but now they're sort of uh, defunct because of everything that's been going on with Remington. and. Now, what's going to happen with the H&R brand? I don't know. The interesting thing about H&R products is even though they've been made for a long time and interesting firearms like this, which I'll talk a little bit about in a minute, uh, do not gain a whole lot of collector value. They are always known as being inexpensive and they have maintained a very inexpensive price point, even used, even if you get something early on pre-World War II like this. Now this particular model was made between 1924 and 1941, and it was a longer barrel variation of the H&R model 1906, which is more of like a defensive uh, concept revolver. This was known again as the Trapper model, meant to be more of a target. Uh, you had a two-piece walnut set. Sorry about that, I just had somebody come in. Uh, these were made with a two-piece walnut grip set, kind of in a target configuration, and a six-inch octagonal, octagonal barrel. The Trapper models were only made in this configuration. Um, this is a double single action. In order to get the cylinder out of the revolver, you remove the base pin and then roll the cylinder out. This was typical of what you would see on a lot of the earlier H&R revolvers, uh, mainly because the concept of the swing out cylinder, if we're talking about the late 1800s to early 1900s, was a pretty innovative design and also more expensive to produce and manufacture rather than just having a simple base pin that goes in and holds your cylinder captive. You feed it by way of a permanently open feed gate. Again, you don't have the added expense of machining something in there that, in there that hinges open like you would on a single action army. So it was pretty typical to find cost-saving measures on products like this from H&R, but they were very functional. Also known for being reliable and very accurate. This points very, very well. It is very, very, very lightweight, very cool product. Now, the price point on these, like I mentioned, are not very expensive. These in really, really good condition are gonna top off at about the $250 price point. Typically where you're gonna find them is around the $200 mark. Um, if you have something very poor uh, condition, it might be around the you know seventy-five uh, dollars to $100 mark. But something like this with the holster, I would expect to be around the two two fifty mark. But anyway, really, really cool products, really cool revolvers. You do see a lot of H&R uh, firearms come in, but a pre-war revolver like this, I, this is probably the first Trapper model I've ever had, even though we have had other H&R revolvers, but pretty cool. Okay, up next I have a pretty interesting little rifle from Keltec. This is a Keltec SU-22, which is the 22LR version of the famous Keltec SU-16. Now the, pri uh, the the rifle platform would actually come out in the early 2000s and is still marketed today by Keltec, so it's been around for quite a while. The main claim to fame on this was its ability to fold down to a very stowable and conveniently carried package. And this was really intended for the survivalist or the prepper market, or for those that do a lot of outdoor backpacking and hiking and things like that. By removing that base pin, you can fold this into a very easily stowable and concealable package. Again, if you wanna take it out with you camping or just keep it under your seat in your truck as sort of a defense a firearm if you end up in a shaky situation or with a flat tire on a dark road somewhere. So really, really cool product. And the SU-16 and the 5.56 has definitely been a very popular design. Now the SU-22 is meant to be a 22 LR companion for training purposes for people who are routinely using their SU-16 rifle. Uh, also great training implement for first time shooters, kids, things like that. 
Um, they are not very expensive. The SU-22 on the new market even today is gonna run you about $450 and they shouldn't be too difficult to find. On the used market, you'll probably be between about three to $350. Um, let me get the base pin back in here if I'm gonna get this in right. Now, going along with the fact that it can fold down, it's also very lightweight. So most of the construction on here is polymer. So the whole stock assembly, receiver assembly, and even fore end is all polymer. Your metal is where it matters most, your bolt carrier, your barrel and your trigger group components. But the overall package on here is around, I'm, I should have measured it, but it's around, I would guess about four to five pounds. So it's very, very lightweight, uh, easy to use, easy to conceal. Now this concept with concealable folding and breakdown rifles has become very popular since the inception of this. Um, and you know, of course, this would probably be one of the first popular uh, designs meeting that type of market. Now, kel as many of you guys know, is based in Florida. They are a small boutique manufacturers. They basically tool up for runs of single lines or double lines of their production, putting out a small quantity of each of their firearms that they make, leaving their products usually in a state of high demand. This is even true in periods of uh, low, um, you know, low sales numbers, for example, even when, you know, in the past four years when sales numbers were really low, it was still always hard to get the more desirable kel be it the PMR-30, the RDB, the RFB, things like the SU-16, the Sub-2000s, things like that. They have also always been known as having a very unconventional approach to firearms design and manufacturing and all their new products that they put out are always sort of very unconventional and always breaking the mold on what we think about in traditional firearm designs, be it the Sub-2000, which is a folding 9mm, or this folding 5.56 or 22, um, or you know the, the CP-33 being a 33 round capacity 22 pistol. Uh, it's just they've always had very unconventional designs that have always been uh, under a lot of interest for people. And they've always been at a very affordable price point, you know, of around uh, you know, the, the three to $400 mark is where most of their products sit. So really, really cool firearms. Uh, this is probably the first SU that sports utility is what SU stands for, uh, rifle I've had in either the, the 5.56 or the 22 LR. So really, really cool to get in. Sure, it won't last long. So there is that, the SU-22. Okay, up next, I have a revolver that has an important place in revolver development and design history with Smith & Wesson. This is a Smith & Wesson Model 36, also known as the Chief Special to some. Now, now, if we go back and look at the late 1940s, post-World War II, we have a lot of our domestic arms manufacturers, and I mean domestic United States-based, Smith & Wesson, Winchester, Colt, that are pivoting away from a wartime manufacturing type of environment where they're mainly concerned with fulfilling contracts with the United States government. They need to transition back to the consumer market. Now, at the time, the late 1940s into the 1950s, we see a growing concern or a need for defensive carry firearms. Now in the 1920s, Colt did release a revolver similar to this, a small pocket size carry, concealed carry revolver, 38 Special, as well as a couple other calibers known as the Detective Special. That firearm did see a lot of uh, sales growth and a lot of interest in the 1920s and 30s, but really started to take off in the late 1940s, again, as concealed carry, defensive carry was becoming more of a concern in the American public. Now, at the time, Smith & Wesson only had a 32 caliber small frame revolver, which was not able to withstand the higher pressures of something like a 38 Special. So wanting to basically uh, come out with something that would compete with the viability of a defensive load as the Colt Detective Special, Smith & Wesson would get together or, or uh, get back to the drawing board on something that would be small, durable and able to handle something like a 38 Special. And what they came out with was the J-Frame. More specifically, the Model 36, would, which would introduce the J-Frame into the Smith & Wesson revolver lineup. Now, obviously today, we enjoy mini J-Frame type revolvers like the 642, the 442, the uh, 38 Special variation of the Bodyguard. So uh, the, the J-Frame has become a staple in the lineup and this is really a, a main reason for that. Now, Smith & Wesson did see itself losing a lot of market share to Colt because of the Detective Special. Again, that was the impetus for wanting to come out with this, the Chief Special, which was obviously a very convenient competitor to that. Now, the Colt Detective Special 
did have a six round cylinder. The J-Frame uh, Chief Special or the Model 36 had a five round cylinder. The size was a little bit smaller than the Colt and a little bit lighter, making it just a little bit more of a easier concealable and carryable firearm. It was more affordable at an entry level price in the 1950s of about $150 uh, than the Colt Detective Special was, uh, but still considered a somewhat pricey and elegant you know, concealed carry firearm. Again, we're talking in, in competition with things like H&R, which we've just been over. Um, today on the consumer market, they did cease manufacturing of the, uh, the Model 36 in 1999, but then would resume production in 2008 with the Classic Series. So you can still get them new today. Most of these that you find used, um, they're going to be in about maybe the five to $600 range, give or take. I mean, if you're a really nice condition with the original box. Uh, you might be again around the uh, the six six fifty mark. Uh, this without the box with some finish wear on it might be around about the five hundred dollar mark. So there are a lot of people who really like these because they are affordable and they are still just a classic Smith and Wesson J frame. There are a lot of buyers on these, so you can still get this and it is a viable defensive uh, firearm, even though it's more of a classic design from from uh, nineteen fifty, which is when this was introduced. Um, it still holds up you know to the test of time today and again today it does compete with things i mean it's still lighter than something like an sp 101 uh and you know with similar capacity so anyway there's that the smith and wesson model 36. okay up next i have a japanese type 38 carbine this was the carbine version of the long rifle the standard model type 38 which entered japanese military service in 1905 which was also the 38th year of emperor meiji's reign where it gets the designation type 38. Now, this was chambered in the 6.5 by 50 millimeter round, not the later adopted 7.7. .7. The Type 38s and the carbines would be used in the Second Sino-Japanese War as well as World War II. If you saw my recent video uh, on the Japanese Type 11 light machine gun, that would have been used in conjunction with this during that time period. Now, because the Japanese were in need of war material and supplies, they would push the 38 carbines and rifles and machine guns uh, the 6.5 uh, variants into military service into World War II, even though they would adopt at that time the 7.7 round and rifles, carbines, and machine guns to go along with that, which did serve into being somewhat of a logistical nightmare. Now, one thing you might notice if you are familiar with this carbine is this has been sporterized. Sporterizing is the act of basically cutting down a military rifle to lighten the weight and load on it to be used for sporting purposes, which is a very common practice, you know, post-war, the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. Now, I wanted to take this opportunity. I did receive a really nice Christmas card from a viewer here on the channel. Uh, I'm a little late into getting into this aspect of the video. He sent a really nice donation to my store on the channel and also asked that I uh, touch briefly on the concept or the idea of a military sporterized rifle. So I wanted to take this opportunity, now that I have in a military sporter, to address that question. So thank you, sir. You know who you are for that card. I already sent a, uh, a thank you letter. I hope you got that in the mail. Anyway, if we look at post-war, and this is true of World War I and World War II firearms, but if you get into, say, the 1950s or the late 1940s, you had military servicemen who were very tired and weary from military service, and you have a public who was very tired of all the the you know, the politics around uh, World War II, uh, you know, family members who were off fighting in the war, mostly, you know, you have the American public is just tired, sick and tired of the war by the time it's over in 1945. What you would have is a lot of people bringing back war trophies like Arasaka's K98 Mausers, and you would have a lot of stuff showing up on surplus markets like, you know, uh, later on you would get things like Enfields and 1903 Springfields and Arasaka's and K98s. They were very, very inexpensive and they were everywhere. There was really no such thing at the time as a collector's market on surplus or World War II firearms. That didn't really start to pick up until about the late 80s, early 90s, when stuff like this started to get collector followings. You had niche markets, people who, you know, maybe through the 70s and 80s were kind of dabbling and collecting Lugers and things like that. But by and large, they were still very inexpensive and there were not a whole lot of people who were really dealing in them or interested in them at the time. This whole thing of, you know, Arasaka's going up for over $1,000 and K98's going for $3,000 and M1 Garand's going for $1,000. This is really a relatively new phenomenon and people living back in the 50s and 60s would probably laugh at the fact that they've gotten so expensive. Because they were viewed as basically just tools, you know, firearms, um, 
it was very common practice for people to take these things. I mean, you could get an Arasaka out of a out of a barrel at a hardware store for probably you know two or three dollars at the time. It was common to take something like this and to have a very inexpensive deer rifle to cut it down to. Uh, you know, remove part of the stock to lighten the overall weight of the package to make it more of a farmhand rifle, a hunting rifle, a sporting rifle, which is where you get the term sporterizing. Uh, they would do things like replace the sights with more modern functional sights. They would recaliber the firearm to something that was commonly found in the United States, like a 308 or a .30-06. The stocks are typically the number one thing that would be butcher. They would cut down barrel lengths. They would re-blue them, refinish them. People would try their engraving, you know, at-home engraving work on them, try their at-home gunsmithing. Uh, so there was just a, a ton of things that people would do to these rifles, again, because they were not worth very much at the time, and nobody would foresee their value exploding in the current, you know, 2020s market or 2010s market as it has today. Because of the act of sporterizing, it has actually reduced the amount of authentic, unmolested firearm examples that are out there on the market. Because of that, it has driven up the price as the rarity of a complete untouched rifle is higher. And of course, the sporterized variations sell for a fraction of what the military configure, or I shouldn't say military, but the untouched configurations actually sell for. Uh, again, because it becomes harder to find the untouched version. Now, when it comes to collectibles like this, people aren't going to pick up a Type 38 Arasaka for the purposes of having a new fun, like, you know, end of the world rifle or a range rifle. People are mainly buying these things as collectibles, and that's where you get the, the large and very high valued market on this stuff. When you start removing its provenance as a military rifle, you butcher the stock, you change the sights, you refinish it, you engrave the stock. Well, none of that was done, obviously. These weren't issued in sporter configurations and K98s weren't issued with deer, you know, engraving on the stock. So because it doesn't really retain much of its original military value, it's worth quite a bit less. If you were to take, for example, an all-matching K98 Mauser, it might be worth about three to four thousand dollars. If you took that same rifle and re-blued it and cut the stock off to make it a sporter, that thing might be worth only about three to five hundred dollars. So that's how drastically it, ha it has affected the value. So that's basically the gist of sporterizing, um, how it kind of came into prominence and the effect on the value of these things, and also is a reason that non-touched original and authentic firearms are commanding such a premium as they are few and far between after having gone through 80, 90 years of being molested, uh, you know, messed with. Uh, and, and sporterized and whatnot. But anyway, there is that for you. Okay, up next I have a pretty cool and iconic rifle. This is a Winchester Model 06 or 1906, which was a less expensive version of the Model 1890 by Winchester. Now the story really begins back in the early 1880s, around 1883, 1884, when Colt would come out with a lightning uh, slide action rifle. Now on that, they had the larger uh, calibers like the 4440, for example, they came out with a small frame variation for the Rimfire 22 caliber version. Now, that was Colt's first 22 uh, rifle and was actually showing a lot of popularity in the consumer market. Now, Winchester wanting to get on board with that commissioned John Moses Browning to come up with a similar slide action 22 rifle to compete in that marketplace. So, in about 1888, John Moses Browning would get to work on the the rifle, which would end up being patented and manufactured as the model 1890 slide fire 22 rifle. Of course, first being manufactured in a 22 short. Now, because it was very popular with kids and people learning firearms and, you know, plinking and, you know, squirrel hunting and things like that, tin can hunting. <laughs> um, it started getting picked up and used in shooting galleries around different carnivals and fair type of experiences where it quickly got the name, the gallery gun as a nickname, because that's predominantly where a lot of them would be found is in shooting galleries of some form or another. Now, the original model 1890 did have an octagonal barrel and it had a crescent butt plate, a little bit more expensive to manufacture. Now, because of the popularity of it, uh, Winchester wanted to come out with a variation that they could produce more of, put out into the marketplace uh, for a more affordable option, giving the opportunity to purchase this to a, a wider host of people in the consumer market. Now, 
interesting enough, and again, 1906, they would come out with this version. Now, just a couple of years prior to this, Colt would actually cease production on the Lightning, which would basically lead to the indications of the Winchester rifle was what was preferred, and it definitely won out in this market. So a couple of years again after the Lightning falls out of existence or manufacture, uh, Winchester would come out, with, come out with the simplified version, which is this, the 1906. Now, the two things that they did to simplify it is they went to a rounded instead of an octagonal barrel, and they went to a flat shotgun profile butt plate with this rubberized kind of hard plastic butt plate on. On it. Other than that, pretty much essentially the same rifle. Both had fired from a hammer and the action, this one's a little bit tight, fired of course as the name would suggest in sort of a slide action or a pump type action. Now there were three variations of this rifle. There was the rim fire, which they only made between 1906 and about 1908, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, the short version, the 22 rim fire short which only fired the 22 shorts and they only made that for a couple years. So if you find one of these in 22 short only, it is a very early gun uh, and worth a little bit more money. Then they had the standard, which was this. So they added grooves to the, uh, to the slide. Um, and then it had a simple walnut straight profile stock. Then they had the expert, which was like this again in 22 long rifle or 22 short, but it had the pistol grip stock on it. Um, later on, by about 1936, this would be phased out of production in favor of the Model 61, which I actually have in former videos. And really the difference there is they went from a external hammer like this to an internal hammer. So there is no hammer spur at the back, but it is still a hammer fired firearm. Episode seven and, and I believe episode nine uh, of the weekly used gun review, I have uh, copies of those. And you can kind of, if you want to hear how the story of this continues, you can go watch those videos. Getting in a price point. Um, this is one of those things that if you're gonna bring in top dollar on these, they need to be in really, really good condition. This particular one, uh, finish has some patina. It's probably at about, uh, I would say 60 to 70% overall, maybe about 60%. There is a little crack right back here in the tang, uh, which on a 22 is not gonna get any worse. This was probably just dropped or something. Um, Otherwise, it's a fair condition rifle. Something like this, maybe around the $400 mark, in a really good pristine condition, especially the early ones in uh, 22 short only, uh, can get up well over $1,000. So again, Winchester collectors like these because there is the nostalgic past of these being used as gallery guns, and they had been really in the consumer market well beyond the 1930s uh, and post-war 50s and 60s. So there's a huge uh, variety of people who grew up with these, even, their grandparents from the 20s and 30s that may have had these and grown up with them as kids would, you know, continue to want to purchase these and then, you know, continue on the shooting sports and enthusiasm with, with their kids and grandkids who are now adults. So, uh, you know, things like this just have a lot of collectors on them. They are really cool. Uh, there's always buyers. And even if you're a new, uh, new shooter, the nostalgic classic Winchester 1890 or 1906 is also a cool one to learn on. I mean, they still are functional and very nice, reliable firearms. There it is, 1906. Okay, last but certainly not least, I have a very popular and iconic rifle. This is a Winchester Model 1873 and a personal favorite of mine. The story with this would begin in 1860 when Benjamin Tyler Henry would develop the Model 1860 Henry rifle. It was iconic for the fact that it had the brass receiver, its brass alloy receiver, and the magazine tube and the barrel were sort of one integral piece which did hinge open at the end. You would bring up your follower on a spring-loaded tab like this, bring it off to the side, load, close the barrel on the magazine tube, let the follower down, and it would follow your rounds down as you threw the lever and continue to feed. You had no fore end on it at all either. Now, he would meet up with Oliver Winchester, which at the time was actually a shirt designer, and they would come up with a New Haven uh, uh, corporation and they would produce the model 1860. It was of course a revolutionary design. This concept of a lever gun. You did have the Spencer carbines and things like this, but this was truly the rifle that you would load on Sunday and shoot all week long. Remember this is around the time of the Civil War and you know we're, we're going from the era of muzzle loaders to repeating rifles like this. Now, the two would part ways in a less than favorable fashion, and Winchester would go on to design the model 1866, which was a derivative off of the 1860. Now, both would use the toggle link action, but the main difference or the main innovation of the 1866, which still used the brass frame, but they incorporated the King's Patent loading gate. So the loading feature that we're all familiar with today on the side loader was debuted on the model 1866. 
Now Winchester did want to come out with a new variation which would be less expensive to produce, a little bit lighter, a little bit more wieldy, a little bit more affordable, and what he came up with uh, was this, the 1873. Now the 1873 was the first of the lever action rifles which actually fired from a center fire cartridge. Remember the 1860 and the 1866 fired from the 44 rim fire. This would come out in the 4440 or the 44 WCF Winchester center fire round as well as 3220 uh, and a couple 38 uh, 38 4 to 3850. I can't remember what the designation on that is. This one here is a 3220. Now there are three distinct variations of this or models, the first model, the second model, and the third model, uh, being produced from 1873 until 1924, 1923, 1920, early 20s is when they would cease production on this. Now this particular one is a third uh, pattern or a third variant, and this was made in 1901, uh, if I remember. It's 1901 to 1903, one of those years in there. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm getting, being a little bit loose with you guys on the dates here. Um, the three variations were really, the, the quickest way you can tell is basically on how the dust cover here was mounted. On the first pattern, there was a Morris section right here on either side of the ejection port on top of the receiver, where the dust cover simply slid into it. On the second pattern, they did add a dovetail here in the back, but it was actually mach machined from a separate piece and then screwed into the top of the receiver. On the third model, they actually just cut the receiver blanks, including that dovetail on top as an integral piece of the receiver, and that would be your third pattern, and this would be a third pattern. Really, really, really cool. Really iconic rifles. This is, fire, is known as the firearm that won the West. Uh, when you're looking at Westerns and stuff, you do see a lot of people using 92s and 94s, trying to portray an 1873 most likely. Um, this is the one, I mean, that most people who are into the old Western style repeater rifles, this is the one everybody gravitates to, the 1873. Really, really cool. Also iconic by this sort of bulged looking piece in the side of the receiver. Kind of, again, the quickest way you could tell you're looking at an 1873. In terms of pricing, this is a really, really hard one to do. The basic configurations you get is they had three. They had the sporting rifle, which is this, a 24-inch octagonal barrel. They did have the options of ordering them with a rounded barrel as well, and a crescent-style butt plate. They had the saddle ring carbine, which had the shotgun-style butt plate, a shorter barrel 20 inches, and the carbine-style uh, fore-end which had a barrel band around it and then the saddle ring carbine thing. They also had a musket variation with a longer barrel with a handguard that would reach out towards the end and that was really intended to be marketed to militaries and it never really came to fruition. Um, the calibers, 4440 is gonna be the most desirable. 3220 like this, probably the least desirable actually. Um, this one does have a Lyman slide on it and also something interesting about this is the former owner looks like they uh, brazed on a extension here to make this more of a completely rounded like a this is the original shoulder thing that goes up if you guys are wondering this is where it all started uh, the shoulder thing that goes up this will add a lot of value to it i'm just kidding but this is uh, something that of course a uh, previous owner and the the metal is actually patinaed really at about the same with the with the rest of the metal on the butt plate so this has probably been on there for a very long time Sorry, getting back to the value. Um, let's just give it a wide range. These uh, 1873's original ones can go for probably about uh, the $900 mark up to four or $5,000, depending on the letter, depending on when it was made, what caliber and what condition. This one is in fair condition. Uh, it had originally been color case hardened. You can see remnants of that in the metal. Most of it is gone, which is usually the case with the original guns. The wood is in really, really good condition. There's a minor, minor crack right down here on the heel of the stock. It's not a big deal. Again, this is over 100 years old. Lots of nice aging and patina. Something like this, 14 to $1,600 is probably about where it would go. Um, the Lyman sight's not gonna hurt it. This is a period sight. Uh, just a nice, honest 1873. Not fantastic, not terrible, just right there in the middle in terms of condition. Um, if you had a 4440, uh, maybe in a saddle ring carbine in 95% condition, you know, thousands of dollars is what something like that would go for. So it's really hard to pinpoint exactly what something like this would be valued at without actually looking at your specific model. But anyway, these are very, very cool rifles. I, I love the 1873. It is definitely my favorite of the lever guns. 
Uh, and of course, I know I'm not alone in that. But anyway, ending this up with an American icon, the Model 1873 Winchester. Well, that is all the time I have for you today on these. Thank you so much for stopping by and checking out this video. If you enjoyed, please let me know by hitting that like button and also consider subscribing to my channel and hitting that bell notification button so you are aware when I am posting new content. Anyway, guys, I'm going to leave you off there. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports in Westfield, Indiana. You are watching Marksman TV, and I will see you next time.